I'm going to start at my top left and, and David ask you to give people the 60 second or so story about who you are. My name is David Ross and I'm in the EDD program. I'm very interested in the Dreyfus model because it has application, I believe, for the work that I do with students in the area of well-being and wellness. So that's the area of special interest to me and I'm always interested in John's John's ability to see the relationship between Levenger, Dreyfus, the curricular models that he's familiar with, etc. So that's why I'm here today. I'm Linda Hartling. I'm really happy to be with you. I'm in Portland, Oregon, and I have been working with John on Dignity Studies, which I think is one of the few programs around the country that's totally focused on looking at dignity issues within uh, coursework. Our organization, which is Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies, has been lucky enough to find this program to partner with, along with our own little project, which is called the World Dignity University Initiative, which is a really embryonic idea about bringing this kind of learning into the larger world. And we consider Wiser a role model of some of the work that's being done in the world. So we're very happy to be partnering with Wiser. My name is Karen. I am an EDD student. I have an interest in the Dreyfus model because of what I do. What I do is I have a business called Provider's Friend. I am a health educator and trainer. I teach people who have licensed facilities that house elderly, uh, developmentally disabled, and some children. Uh, And I also teach home care aid and other health education courses in community colleges and adult schools. My name is Sudia Paloma, and I'm the Chair of Doctoral Studies in Education at Wiser in Berkeley. I'm also the Executive Director of the Center for Critical Environmental and Global Literacy, and we do environmental institutes, and we work internationally. At the moment, we have a 12-year project in the state of Oaxaca in Mexico with indigenous communities of environmental activists, of language um, preservation activists, as anti-GMO activists. And before that, we were working for 10 years in El Salvador. We worked for two years in, in Cuba and in Guatemala and in Eastern Europe and um, Romania and Hungary, usually working with groups are, who are on the margins of the dominant educational system, but are struggling to create an educational system that serves their communities. My name is Melvi. I'm also a Wiser student and on track for the MFT program. Very excited about being here. Definitely interested in the Dreyfus model, as I think it any education or able to assess is uh, skills acquisition would be wonderful. So um, I'm Gillian Gillette, hard G, soft G, as I say, because my name has two Gs. And yeah, I'm a new student uh, with the MFT program, and I'm just stepping in. I've already started hearing the Dreyfus model being thrown about, and I thought, I don't, I've heard it a number of times and don't really have an idea of uh, what it really is. I just have a sense of it. So I thought I would join and just start learning what it is. Hi, I'm Victor and I'm uh, uh, in the EDD program. San Diego is the land of the Kumeyaay nation and uh, (laughs) they've been here 10,000 consecutive years and uh, the land was of course stolen like every other place and they were there survived genocide but there's this uh, rejuvenation and, and reclamation going on so the dominant world is recognizing them more and um, years and years ago a good friend of mine he became a very good friend he died a couple of years ago he founded a, uh, a language re- reclamation program it was very similar in the very beginning years as the reclaiming Hebrew was a hundred years ago, except they did not have a written language to build on. Anyways, we became really good friends. And listening to everybody, I was thinking about how relevant Vygotsky is to my dissertation question, which could be boiled down to, is it possible to schmooze online? (laughs) Some people, not everyone, just some people. (laughs) We're going to talk about a few theories in addition to Dreyfus, but Dreyfus will be the focus. So the Dreyfus theory is about expert knowledge. It's a theory of progressive stages of increasing expertise, whether one's talking about specific skills like playing chess or a broad knowledge base like being a uh, expert therapist, you know, so you could think of as a, in a variety of different domains of, of knowledge and skills. 
it's different from a lot of views of expert knowledge in that it's not particularly linear or formulaic or mechanistic. Those of you who know me know that if I come across something that's particularly linear or formulaic, I have to run and get the Benadryl because I, I, start, to, <laughs> I start to break out. Why don't, why, don't she use, why don't she use carpentry instead of chess? Yeah, well, carpentry also would probably be the case. I mean, you could use carpentry as an example. Uh, Sadia's husband, Craig, is a carpenter. Yeah, we've been talking about it, and so we're using that one. And Yeah, you could use that one. So anyway, it can apply to a variety of domains, and I'll say more about its, uh, its kind of delightful complexity as we, as we move along here. A few other theories that are, are relevant to think about in relation to Dreyfus and in relation to some of the concerns that different ones of us have are this particular theory of human development, which is... Hi, Brian. Welcome. I'm Brian Gerard. I'm <laughs> the Chief Academic Officer for WISER. I have been using the Dreyfus model for a couple of years now, and uh, my wife has pointed out to me that in cleaning the kitty litter box, I am expert, but in the kitchen, I'm advanced beginner. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, Brian. <laughs> I'm glad the theory is being put to use in your household. Yes. Hi, Rosa. I'm Rosa. I'm a wiser doctoral student. I'm a student service co uh, the student services coordinator. And your faculty member. Faculty member, yes. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Jane Levenger has this theory of ego development that is also relevant for us to think about in relation to all of this. Her theory of ego development is different than some developmental theories in that it has a fairly strong emotional and cognitive aspects to it. So in, in the realm of human development, one will encounter theories like, let's say, Eric Erickson that are strongly emotionally focused. One will encounter theories like Piaget's that have a strong cognitive component. Well, Levenger is pretty strongly both. The transitions and stages that people go through in Levenger's framework are by no means identical to nor completely parallel with the Dreyfus model but they, they overlap. Not overlap, there's parallels and similarities that are quite worth paying attention. In addition, in my experience, in the early and mid 70s, when I was first involved in college teaching, um, my, my, myself and a colleague of mine, the late Harry Butler, who sadly passed away, we developed an innovative program at the University of Cincinnati that was kind of a pre wiser like program, but embedded in a traditional college of community services in Cincinnati. So we became aware of kind of progressions of, you might call it, level of learner-centeredness in curricula, with the most traditional being package courses that have absolutely no input at all from students couple of learning contract models that get some input from students, the closed contract and the open contract gets more input. And then the ideal that we were aiming for in Cincinnati and that we aim for at Wiser is called the experimenting community, which is much more open than the open contract. Although a detail that's important to keep in mind is Harry and I realize that whenever you offer an academic degree, it always, to some degree, creates some contradictions and tensions that restricts the learning process. And I will also confess that, that although there's some really, really good reasons for learning about the Dreyfus model, to learn about expert knowledge and teaching and learning, even human development, at Wiser, there's also, in addition, not only, but in addition, there are some crass reasons, which is we thought, well, the Dreyfus theory is a good theory for us to use. I'm kind of half kidding and half being serious because Dreyfus had the good wisdom to agree with us. You know, I mean, so, you know, it's kind of like a, the Dreyfus, you know, obviously they developed their model and we developed our thoughts independently over the years from Dreyfus. But at some point, about 20 or so years ago, we realized, gee, this Dreyfus model is really, there's a lot. That dry, there, there's two brothers involved, that the two Dreyfus brothers are saying that's in many ways very consistent with what we're saying. So that's kind of, you know, and they say some of the stuff much better than we do. And the, the last theoretical framework to be aware of, in addition to Levenger, the curriculum models, and Dreyfus, at least for our purposes today, is the uh, social learning theory of Lev Vygotsky. And Vygotsky was a, a, a Russian psychologist who, uh, fell out of favor with Stalin, as a lot of people did. But he had a very valuable theory, which some people in the U.S. have paid attention to and many have ignored. It's partly about the importance of how we learn from social situations and from other people and with other people. It's not 
the typical individualistic American view of things. It's, it's more of a social view of, of learning. Yeah, and it also is used a lot in even elementary, middle school, high school education. This, it becomes a justification for doing small group cooperative learning. Yeah, so it's been used increasingly in, in recent years. I would say arguably not as much as it could or should be. Basically says that, that when people are just about ready to transition to another stage of learning and development, if they have somebody that already has made that transition that can kind of help them through that transition, this is an optimal process, you know, like somebody that's almost ready to learn something. It can be even a parent in parenting, you know, that, you know, when a child is just about ready to learn something, to take on a particular learning challenge, having the benefit of a parent or a sibling or teacher, or somebody work with them in through that transition can be a very valuable mm -hmm. thing. Can I use an example from sure. the lower grade? So yeah. sometimes we ask young people to build a tower to build a tower um, using newspaper and just one roll of duct tape. And um, we see that if a person, a young child is asked to do it by themselves, it's really a challenge, it's really difficult. But in the company of four or five peers, some of them who maybe have higher skills than they do, they're able to build together as a group, all of them doing it in cooperation, um, a much more successful tower than the child who had to do it by themselves. And then a few days later, if that individual is asked to build a tower, they can go to a different stage on the Vygotsky line of proximal development because they have the experience of working with others and now their own ability and capacity to do it on a higher level has moved because of the collaboration that they experienced. You know, that's a great example. and. and What's needed for Brian is somebody who's at the confident level just beyond advanced beginner to help him in the kitchen to make the transition from advanced beginner to confident. <laughs> well, when Brian was going through that one day and his, um, his wife had dinner ready and we were in the middle of a conversation, he said he had to leave or she might divorce him. And I said, you know, all relationships can be repaired with a little bit of um, WD-40 and some duct tape. Here's these four stage or three theories, and I added a thing here called key emotional qualities that I want to talk a little bit about. Dreyfus model has these stages of novice, advanced beginner, competent, proficient, and experts beyond it. For our purposes, I've lumped proficient and expert together because proficient is really hard to get to. And once a person gets to proficient, the main thing that gets them to expert beyond proficient is a number of additional years of wisdom and experience. Because once they get to proficient, they probably have the wherewithal to become expert. But it's just a huge quantity of, of experience. At the novice stage, the novice is, as it suggests, a novice, and they take a, a rule-oriented approach to things, like what you think of as like a cookbook approach. So it literally would be, you know, you have to follow every little step, and it has to be spelled out with you, and you kind of slavishly follow it, not really understanding much, but you can kind of follow the rules. And the Dreyfus brothers, two brothers, Hugh Dreyfus, who passed away just recently, a few years ago, was a philosopher and a philosophy professor at UC Berkeley. And his brother, Stuart, was a, an engineering professor at UC Berkeley. I first became aware of them when I was doing some research on really good college teachers. And Hugh Dreyfus, the philosopher, was known to be a really, really dynamic, interesting teacher that students at UC Berkeley really valued his instruction. He was especially known, not so much for his theory of knowledge, but just as a really good professor on existentialism and Kierkegaard. I then became aware, maybe in the, in, in the mid-80s, of... Uh, an interesting article that he and his brother wrote on the emergency response behavior of airplane pilots in crisis situations. It was a study done for the U.S. Air Force. And they basically were talking about how not people at these different stages, novice, advanced beginner, competent, or proficient or expert, as air pilots would respond to crisis situations. Well, a novice cannot function in a crisis situation. It's just, I mean, you know, just forget about it. So, I mean, a novice can't even really function that well if you just make it a little bit of an unusual situation. So if you're talking about flying an airplane, 
maybe a novice with somebody, you know, seated, seated next to them can get the plane off the ground and land it safely by themselves, but under careful supervision in perfect weather conditions. But you, you get the wind up to 30 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour. It's not even a crisis, but it's just a little bit of a wind. The novice isn't going to be able to fly the plane. <laughs> That's just the way it is. I'm sorry. You don't want to be you don't want to be flying with the novice being the pilot under anything other than optimal conditions. And this would similarly apply to, you know, most of the areas that people uh, like all of you who are wiser faculty and students work with, whatever the realm is, whether we're talking about playing chess or, or like Karen, like in your area, like if somebody is providing home care, they can maybe follow a checklist of what to do with, with good home care. But if anything at all, other than an absolutely standard situation is going on in somebody's household, they're, they're probably going to make some mistakes or not do something, you know, properly. And when I say anything other than a standard household, the reality is most everything isn't a standard household. <laughs> a standard household is kind of a, a, a figment of our imagination. So in, in a way, a novice learns their skill in a situation that's almost not real <laughs> because it's like rules that apply to what an idealized interpretation of the situation might be, you know, rather than the way it really is. So the advanced beginner, however, when, when somebody gets to the point of advanced beginner, they have some guidelines and they're not narrow rules. It's a little bit like what some of you've heard me talk about Thomas S. Kuhn and his, you know, his book, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, where people are, uh, uh, scientists, you know, follow a, a dominant theory. Well, the advanced beginner can follow the dominant theory or a theory, but usually it will be a, you know, a, a prevailing, often agreed upon theory of practice, a theory of thinking, a theory, be a theory of how to play chess. An advanced beginner doesn't just know the rules of the chess game in terms of, you know, the novice just knows the pieces on the chess board, what moves they can make, how many squares there are, and what the objective is. You're supposed to get checkmate with the other king or something. That's, that's all the novice knows. They kind of know the rules and they know what's allowed and what isn't allowed and what the goal is. Uh, they might pick up a couple of real simple techniques like you can lose your pawn, but don't lose a really valuable piece like, a, you know, your queen or a rook or something like that. The advanced beginner learns strategies. The advanced beginner learns some principles. So the advanced beginner now has kind of a conceptualization of what to do. An advanced beginner can kind of go beyond techniques to actually dealing with some variations in situations, not necessarily a lot of variations, but, but they can deal with some situational variations. That the, the advanced beginner is expert enough to know that situations matter. <laughs> Let's put it that way. They, they, they're at least expert enough to know that you can't you can't, there, there isn't a one size fits all approach to everything. Brian, Brian, you probably learned that if you have more dishes to wash than usual, you at least need to do something different when you're stacking the dishes than you, you do otherwise or something like that. That actually is completely accurate. <laughs> yeah, right. So this is the hallmark of a kind of an, an advanced beginner person in the kitchen <laughs> they could deal with thing and, and, and some other things too that might be beyond that. How to chop an onion without crying. Yeah anyway uh, the, the competent person and, and now now we're really getting into what a professional does. Most professionals in most professions are competent. I mean many aren't obviously because you could say some are really incompetent and we all know that. But but if they're a professional that that like we would that, you know that we would have a certain amount of respect for uh, we'd say they're competent. You know, this is what this is what professionals are supposed to be. You know, so that you know, at Wiser, we would aim that our students, by the time that they graduate, even though they're still working for their license, we would expect them to be competent. We would expect them to be competent therapists. Uh, we would expect uh, you know people that are you know school teachers to be competent school teachers. Karen, like if, if you were working with uh, a group of health educators to to be not just paraprofessionals, but, you know, pretty somewhat versatile and, and, and deeply uh, expert, you would want them to be competent. A proficient person is beyond competent and they get into a certain amount of creativity or even, even a fair amount of creativity. So the proficient person has gone beyond competent. And when people see a stage model, their immediate tendency is to think that everybody has to get to one of the highest stages right away. 
proficiency does not come about easily, an expert even much less so. Somebody that's proficient is really like ultra competent. You know, they're like really competent. They know nuances of details of situations. They have a reservoir of experience and wisdom. They can distinguish between a variety of situations. You know, the kinds of things, for example, Karen, that you write about when they like, well, what happens when you have a situation where either the caregiver or the person receiving care either don't speak the same language or one doesn't hear so well or whatever, what has to happen then and what would be some strategies around it? The fact that you, Karen, can identify that kind of a problem, that kind of a challenge, and then come up with some strategies for addressing it suggests that you're at least proficient. In other words, somebody has to be proficient to identify that, to begin to develop some creative strategies for addressing it. So this is a a, a very high level. Yes, I would also say that the word proficient, I mean, the English language is rich. John, I would not refer to you as a proficient college teacher, or John, Brian either. I wouldn't use the word proficient with you. Right now, we're we're using the Dreyfus language. You know, we're not trying to use it in a common sense way. We're using the Dreyfus language. The example that many of you have heard me give, at at the risk of boring half of the group, I'll, I'll, I'll use it again. I'm going to give you an example of expert knowledge and skill behavior. The example that I love to use, that again, many of you will have heard, but is when Captain Scully landed his plane in the Hudson River. Mm. You know, the, he took off in the plane and it was going to very possibly crash. Well, it did have to do a crash landing, but it did a, a very graceful crash landing of all places in the Hudson River. Only somebody that was probably even beyond proficient and to expert, because one of the differences between proficient and expert, an expert can almost spontaneously and intuitively make those quick judgment calls that maybe a proficient person will sometimes do and maybe they won't. It's not that experts never make mistakes, but more often than not, experts will do pretty darn good at whatever they're doing. So if they're a therapist and something comes up with a client all of a sudden and it's particularly challenging, maybe it's not perfect, but they'll come up with a you know, to use a good therapy phrase, a good enough immediate intervention intuitively based on their expertise. And Scully came up with a good enough immediate intervention because he didn't have a lot of time to think and he landed the plane in the Hudson River and everybody was safe. There was, you know, they, you know, the plane got wet and maybe it was damaged, but there was no big disaster. Scully was called up on the carpet by the FAA. And the reason he was called up on the carpet was because he didn't follow the algorithms that they were quote unquote supposed to follow. And the algorithms are basically what an advanced beginner would follow. That's the paradigm. The advanced beginner follows well-developed, well-thought-out algorithms. But those algorithms begin to break down in many situations, even though they do work for a lot of situations. You know, the novice doesn't have algorithms. So the novice is going to be the loss with any kind of variability. Advanced beginners are going to do pretty good. And also early-stage competent people use algorithms too. They'll have They'll say, well, like this, or I could do that, and it's kind of structured, but yes, there's these alternatives, and maybe I need to do this, and maybe I need to do that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a distinction between, I'll say more about this later, between an early stage competent person and a later stage competent person. The advanced beginner and the early stage competent person is going to use algorithms. They're going to use broad principles, but you start throwing something that's too complicated at them, too unusual, too out of the box and they're gonna have problems. Well, it's a good thing that Scully didn't try to use one of the algorithms, because if he tried to use one of the algorithms, the plane product might have crashed in a very, very bad way, and some people might have been injured or killed. So it was very good that he didn't <laughs> opt for any of the algorithms. Right. Uh, don't, don't, we, don't you sometimes use the word intuition based yeah. on a lot of experience and knowledge? Yeah, I do. It's intuition based on a lot of knowledge and experience, and so it's both a quantity of experience, but it's also a quantity of kind of critically reflected on the experience. So, you know, people could get a lot of experience and if they kind of don't think very carefully about it, that doesn't count the same as if you've had a lot of experience and you're continually mentally processing the experience to try to, you know, figure things out and make note of, of what's going on. And, and yes, and so the intuition is a big deal. 
there's a lot more I want to introduce, but I want to just stop right there for now. That's my quick, but it's only the beginning, my quick introduction to Dreyfus. Let me see, especially those of you that maybe haven't heard about Dreyfus before, any of you, but especially those that haven't heard, if you have some comments or questions about that much. Well, I just wanted to say that in, in, in terms of as you make your way up in the Dreyfus model, from what I'm understanding from you, is that also as you get more towards expert, there's more spontaneity and ability. Yeah. Like spontaneity is also a really big piece of being yeah. expert. Is Expert is not to be taken lightly in the sense of this is not somebody that just studies really hard for three years and then they're an expert. You know, it's like the expert is literally, you could almost substitute the word wisdom, you know, kind of practical wisdom, practical and, and learned and theoretical wisdom and, you know, all of that wrapped together. So it's, it's really a little bit of a, the, the expert is almost, I'm not trying to mystify it, but it's almost kind of a Zen-like state of knowledge in the area. You know, it can be in a lot of areas, you know. I mean, I guess there was, you know, uh, you know, the famous book like the, the, the Zen of the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Or what, you know, it's like one could be, I mean, I've gone, not recently, unfortunately, but because uh, it, it, it is not available anymore for many years, but they used to have this one auto mechanic, and I would just take my car to the auto shop, and he would kind of like listen to it and kind of look at it and say, oh, I know what the problem is. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, you know, I know what's wrong with your car and then he would know how to fix it. You know, it was like he had a, a highly expert intuition that he could kind of pick up on all kinds of nuances that you can't even hardly put in the words of what was wrong with the car. And this could be applied a lot of areas from everything from playing chess to being a, you know, an expert therapist, an air, air aircraft pilot, or a uh, valuable resource in the kitchen. <laughs> Can I share about the um, model as it relates to home care for the novice? Actually, all of them would have a toolbox and they have the same identical tools, except as you graduate from the novice to expert, your toolbox increases. So that novice, you're looking at s skills at this point and how to use those yeah. tools. So right. as you use the tools, you're looking at patient outcome too. Right. So I've got this uh, toolbox and these are the things that I do because this is what is supposed to happen. So okay. as I progress, my toolbox gets bigger or I start using the tools differently because yeah, I get that. more intuition. I now can not only use that gate belt to help somebody walk, oh wow, I can use it to get someone out of bed too. Right. Yeah. That may not have been in the, the initial use of the toolbox, but as I progress to that proficient, now I am not only had that senior for home care, I've worked with developmentally disabled clients. I've worked with this client. That, so that means my toolbox has gotten bigger because now I have more skills, more knowledge, more experience, and more understanding of what it takes to get a better patient outcome. Does that make sense? That, that makes sense. It isn't just that the toolbox gets bigger. The way one thinks about the toolbox changes. So the novice which, who has the toolbox at first begins to, at the advanced beginner stage, is pretty good, actually. You know, advanced beginners are pretty good for a lot of things. So the advanced beginner is, first of all, unlike the novice, going to be able to situationally adapt how they use the tool. They may not even have any new tools, but they're going to situationally adapt how they use the tools. And so they're going to have some strategies for using the tools. And the word is strategies, plural. More than one strategy, they're going to have some principles that will enable them to figure out which tools to use or how to readapt the tools in a situation. So, the, so they're going to know, for example, oh, this is a household with a developmentally disabled person, and in this kind of a household with a developmentally disabled person, these tools need to oftentimes be readapted in this way, and that becomes a principle. It becomes a concept that they have that has evolved or emerged for them because of their awareness that not everybody is the same, not every situation is, is the same. The competent person beyond the advanced beginner is going to become aware not just of a number of tools, whereas the advanced beginner is aware of a number of tools and how to adapt the tools, 
The competent person all of a sudden now is aware that there's a number of principles and there's places where the principles apply and the principles don't apply. So it's almost like the competent person may know like, well, there's this principle involved in developing a strategy for how I'm going to give home health care to somebody who's in a developmentally disabled circumstance. And also, I realize that maybe developmentally disabled circumstances are going to be complicated by cultural differences or, you know, all of a sudden they, they become aware of a whole host of interacting considerations. They also become aware of an increasingly large number of alternatives for how to solve problems. And the alternatives to use are not obvious. And I want to say more about that in in a bit. But a big issue for the competent person is, in the early stages, the competent person is aware that there's a lot of alternative strategies they can use. And as they get deeper in the competent, they not only become aware that there are alternatives, they're so painfully aware, and I'm intentionally using the word painfully, they're so painfully aware that there's a lot of alternatives that this becomes a little bit of a problem for them. It becomes a problem because they start to fret and worry about whether or not they've really picked the right alternative. They're so competent, they're more acutely aware of the possibility that they might make a mistake. Sometimes they become blocked. And they can become blocked. So I'm going to jump down to the key emotional qualities. It's going to relate to Levenger. We're going to go back to Levenger in a minute. This key emotional quality is something I came up with on my own, but drawing on other people's research. And actually, I'm going to talk about Levenger and emotional qualities together with Dreyfus. I'm going to leave aside the curricular models. That's kind of a little bit of an afterthought. That's not super important for our immediate purpose today. Levenger has this theory of ego development that's kind of emotionally oriented, as I stated before, but it also has a strong cognitive element. And you might consider Levenger an extension into adulthood of what Piaget started, except uh, of Piaget's cognitive developmental model, except that Levenger has a strong emotional component to it. And it's also noteworthy the, of the fairly significant developmental theorists. She's noteworthy because she actually developed her model in part by doing something really, really imaginative and innovative. Does anybody want to know what kind of research she did that was imaginative and innovative that most other developmental theorists before her did not do? Who are you talking about? Levenger. Levenger. Any guesses? Okay, I'll I'll give you the answer. She did research on girls and women, not just boys and men. (laughs) How original. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, who would have thought of looking at 51% of the population to develop a theory? The conformist is where most people get to as adults and they stay there. Statistically, most people are conformists. They conform to the prevailing societal norms. Their thinking in terms of how to approach problems is fairly structured, fairly conforming. And the key emotional quality of conformist that Levenger pointed out is comfort. The conformists want to feel comfortable. They don't want a lot of cognitive dissonance. They don't want to have any more worry than they can, you know, can avoid. They just, you know, kind of want things to be stable, functional. And I'm not using that in any sense in a pejorative way. It has, in my view of things and in Levenger's view of things, some limitations that are quite significant. But it's not like somebody's a bad person if they're conformist. They just are. And they're comfortable being that way. And they're fairly structured. It's not impossible to, for them to go beyond novice in terms of expert knowledge, but let's just say that it's not the easiest thing for them to do. Things get, in my view, very interesting at the advanced beginner stage, and there's a significant number of people that get to the Levenger stage self-conscious, which she considers really a transition from conformist to conscientious. And the self-conscious stage is actually fairly common as well, especially in our society. And it's a very common circumstance for traditional college age people. People aged, you know, 17 to 23 or so in our society are not uncommonly self-conscious. Not that they can't be before that, not that they can't be after that age wise, but that's a period of time when in our society, more than a few people, maybe even arguably a majority even, question conformity, and they become aware that there's a lot of alternatives. Reality is not so cut and dried. And so I've put as the emotion for self-conscious curiosity. 
people that become curious do move out of conformity. And the curiosity becomes a more compelling emotion than comfort. You know, for the conformist, and we all like to be comfortable to some degree, and maybe to some degree, many of us like to be curious. But for the conformist, comfort is a compelling emotion. For the self-conscious person, curiosity is a compelling emotion. And once one gets bit by the bug of curiosity, it probably persists, even though it coexists with other emotions. And the holy curiosity comes in, right? Well, I know, that's, that's, the, that's the cue for your song, <laughs> holy curiosity, to the end. <laughs> at the end, at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a yeah. quick question. When you say self-conscious, do you mean like awareness of self or do you mean, like, could you just define yeah, what yeah, you yeah, yeah. It does involve some awareness of self, but it is more than that. So, so your question is a very apt. The self-conscious person, one of their key features, as Levenger talks about the self-conscious person, is that the self-conscious person is very aware of relativity and ethics and viewing reality in a lot of ways. The conformist thinks that kind of the conformist thinks that there's pretty much a set way of looking at things. You know, it's the way that everybody else looks at things and that's that, you know, that's just the way things are. The self-conscious person says, oh, you know, there's no absolute right and wrong. There's no absolute this, there's no absolute that. And they begin to question absolutes. And unlike some of the later stages, if somebody becomes so fascinated, or I would even argue preoccupied with being self-conscious, they may spend most of the rest of their life taking the following viewpoint. Everything's a matter of opinion. You got your opinion. I got my opinion. We all got opinions. And that's no all absolute, I can say. No absolute no, truth. No, no absolute, and not only is there no absolute truth, there's not much point in even trying to figure out much other than the fact that we know we got different opinions. You know, we're just going to kind of leave it at that. Just going to leave it at, you know, you got your opinion, I got mine. We don't need to try to figure out why you think you do, why I think what I do. It's just, you know, the world's complicated, got different opinions. It's a kind of a struck in the transition between absolute truth and the idea that there may be multiple truths, but there's something more to wrestle with, given that there are multiple truths. The self-conscious is just curiosity is an end in itself, being self-conscious in itself. And the advanced beginner is fairly comfortable with their paradigm. The self-conscious person has a paradigm, in their case, of kind of relativism. Mary Beth, was that enough about self-conscious? Do you have some other things about that you'd like us to talk or think about? No, I think that that, that makes sense. Thanks for clarifying it. Self -con I feel like the word self-conscious is, well, it's a little bit loaded because it can mean so many different things. It, it, it is loaded and it is Levenger's almost like technical use of what she means by self-conscious. And I think probably what she means by self-conscious is it's a transition point or transition period, and it ends up sometimes not being a transition, but just being its own, own next period that people settle into, where the person becomes aware of their own values and opinions and doesn't simply conform to the society. Yeah. Could it, could it be um, at all connected to what young people now are calling becoming woke? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah certainly is an awakening in general, not uncommon in late adolescence. I want to get on to the, the next stage because here's where things get really interesting and here's where things become most relevant to Wiser because Wiser mostly has master students and doctoral students. And so from the standpoint of us thinking about our own progress in our own field, the next two, three, and four stages, which you can kind of think of stage three here on this chart as being what expected of master students and stage four is what's expected of doctoral students. It's not to say that a master student might not to stage four. It's just saying at a minimum they should go to stage three. We have very few bachelor students ever and it's not to say that our bachelor students are only going to be advanced beginner. They could in many cases be competent or beyond. They're only expected to be advanced beginner. So if we're putting this in the framework of Weiser's degree program objectives in every realm at a minimum, we would expect our bachelor students, by the time they're finished, to be advanced beginner in all of the different areas of multiculturalism, 
self-directed learning, expertise in their particular field of study, et cetera, we would expect them to be an advanced beginner. And similarly, in all the domains of action research, multiculturalism, marriage and family therapy, if they're a master's student, in, in all those various ways, we would expect a master's student to eventually become competent, and we would expect a doctoral student to eventually become proficient. So let's talk more about what those are. So it's really expertise um, or advanced beginner in the field in which they're pursuing the degree. The field in which they're pursuing the degree, and in the case of WISE, it's a good clarification to the in the field in which they're pursuing the degree and in the few areas that kind of the motherhood and apple pie at WISER, WISER's few metacompensy areas of multiculturalism, awareness of social justice, learning about action research, writing and communicating with others, being a self-directed learner. So we have right. these, these handful of kind of core learning areas. So in, the, in our core learning areas, the ones I just mentioned, and in the domain of their, you know, area of study. Yeah. You don't have to be an advanced beginner chess player or an advanced beginner auto mechanic or, right, right. or anything else, right? Yeah, well, take Mark, for example. He comes in as an expert in technology or in glass blowing, right. but he's pursuing right. a BA. Yeah, you, might be, you might be an expert in something else. You know, it's kind of like, right. you know, you know it doesn't... It's not your whole persona. It's right. not... Yeah, and that's, a, that's an important thing to add because the Dreyfus thing is area-specific. Once one can become any level higher than one in the Dreyfus model in any area it potentially makes it easier to do it in other areas. Potentially. It doesn't mean that you will. And here's where the Vygotsky notion comes in. Here's my tweak on the Vygotsky notion. We can be our own mentors in areas that will help to make the transition, like you were talking about building a tower. I'll give an example in my case. It's an example I write about in the last chapter of my book, and it's a, it's a silly example because it's, it's very idiosyncratic to me, and it's a very bizarre thing. But in the 1980s, I decided, I wasn't thinking of it in Dreyfus terms, I decided I wanted to go from between a novice advanced beginner dancer to a proficient dancer. And I needed to do a whole lot of things related to dancing to do that. But the fact that I had had experience doing that in at least an area or so having to do with like teaching and learning. I kind of like knew how to become a proficient person in facilitating teaching and learning in that content area. I was able to strategize how to move myself along and the things I would need to do in the dance realm to move along. So I was kind of, in, you might say, in a certain sort of a way in the Vygotsky model, I served a little bit as my own mentor of finding the right situations to put myself in that would be the zone of proximal development to enable me to inch along in a new area of endeavor. The main point for our purposes here that you just raised, though, is you're, one is not the same level in every area, just like Brian said. He might be proficient with the, or even expert with the, the kitty litter, but only advanced beginner in the kitchen. That's true of all of us. You know, it's kind of like I'm novice, as my wife will attest, in a number of areas, such as like home repairs. <laughs> Here's the thing about Levenger, too. Levenger's stage theories are tricky because it become an easy way to try to pigeonhole some people as being better than other people and more advanced and other people are kind of, you know, really not so advanced, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of, it can be used in pretty nasty ways if we're not careful. So we have to be careful how we use these developmental models. And as you're suggesting, Sadia, they're not so cut and dry. So even in the area of ego development, somebody is beyond conformity and self-conscious it doesn't mean that they're going to act self-conscious every moment of the day. They may act like a conformist 90% of the time. It just means they have the capability of some proportion of the time being self-conscious and being beyond conformist. Or somebody could be conscientious some portion of the time. And this is where the emotions come in. The emotions can push us forward or pull us back in terms of where we are developmentally, too. By the way, the home repair thing, we call them honeydews. Honey, do this. Honey, do that. Please. Oh, no, no, actually, no, 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 no. You got it wrong, Sadia. My <laughs> wife does not say that to me. She knows that she just has to do it. <laughs> I, we do it. 
I need to do this. I need to do that. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying. In the Carpenters Union, where my husband was part of, they used to call them honeydews. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. But what I'm saying is some people are very, very sharp like my wife is. And so she knows what my limitations are. Anyway, okay. So back to a more relevant topic. Do people have any comments? Yeah, the analogy, and sorry I was late, by the way. That's okay. But uh, I was thinking about your tweak on Vygotsky. And I yeah. think another good analogy is once somebody learns like a second language pretty well, their way of going about learning a third or a fourth language, it's a much different experience. That's a great example. That's a great example. That, that, that's very, very apt for us. I appreciate you adding that. So let's talk about competence. I want to talk about the competence stage. And it relates to Levenger's stage of conscientious and the emotional quality of responsibility for that third kind of stage or level on my chart here is highly well documented in research by Benner on nurses and nursing education. And Levenger talks about responsibility as being a key quality in, for the conscientious person. So let's talk about the competent slash conscientious responsible person. The conscientious person, unlike the self-conscious person, has made a commitment to some values. They may realize that things are relative and everybody may not agree with them. There's no absolute way to decide what's right or wrong. But for themselves, they've made a commitment. And usually in the case of the conscientious person who's competent in at least one area, doesn't have to be competent in a lot of areas, just one, they've made a commitment. The most common thing in our society that illustrates this is most professionals. Most professionals are conscientious who've made a commitment to the values of their profession. Doctor, nurse, lawyer, teacher, teacher, a variety of things. Obviously, there are people that are in those professions who aren't competent, who aren't conscientious. But for the most part, most actually are. And they feel a sense of responsibility. And Binner, who's used the Dreyfus model to do a lot of research in the field of nursing education, has found that one of the key things observed with nursing students as they become conscientious and competent is that they care about the outcomes of their practice. Mm -hmm. It's like it matters to them whether or not, it's like if they make a mistake, you know, if you're a nurse or your doctor, you're so supposed to be detached and you, you know, you realize, you know, some people may die and you put forth your best effort and they still die or they get more sick or whatever. Still, it does matter to them whether or not they feel they were successful. At some yes. level, it matters to them. A good teacher, it will matter to them whether or not their students learn. If their students learn really well, they'll tend to be kind of excited, exhilarated. If the students don't, they may be frustrated. They may be, maybe they're not beating themselves up, but they may be frustrated or not feel so great about it. Emotions matter in a big way in the development of expertise when one gets to the competent level. At the competent level, emotions matter more than at any of the previous stages. Yeah. As an example, a teacher realizes in teaching something that's, that there's a child who's just not getting it and but, says to the child, you know what, why don't you bring your lunch at lunchtime, let's have lunch together and I'm gonna help you to understand this. That is also what's called a conscientious trait, even, every, and even in everyday language. You would say, the teacher that asked the child to come to lunch extra to get, get some extra help from them, they are being conscientious. That's a quality of the competent person. And they also do have whether- Emotion, it's emotion too. It's emotion. And it's conscientious as emotion. It has the emotion of responsibility. It's like, I have a responsibility to help this child to learn. And they also usually have some values to which they're committed. A lot of professional associations get a little bit rote about it. It's kind of trite, but they have their standards of, you know, we all agree that we're going to try to abide by these values. Unlike the self-conscious person that doesn't feel compelled to commit to any particular values, or if they do, it's just they themselves, there's a group value that may be non-conforming. Maybe it conforms to society, maybe it doesn't. But it could be a very non-conforming group, and the person will agree to be responsible to the values of that group, but it's to a group. They have an identity that they're part of a group. And by the way, Linda, I wouldn't boil it down to this, so I don't want to oversimplify it. 
but to some degree, one could even argue that the members of your global network have chosen that as a group whose values that they agree to, and I don't mean this in a trivializing or negative way, that they kind of salute, you know, I mean, you know, it's kind of like, well, yeah, this is, this is good stuff. Two thumbs up for this group. I'm going to, now, it doesn't mean they can't still be proficient and expert, but it means at the very least, if they're going to be engaged with your group, at the very least, they're going to aim to be competent within the realm of what that group wants. They might go beyond that, but at the very least, they're going to probably expect that much of themselves. I'm going to hypothesize that. That's, yeah. that's I will say I will say this, John. I'd say we have a common denominator, yeah. and people are working in a huge variety of diverse ways in the world, but we share this common denominator. And, we and embrace that, it yeah. rather than and salute it. I, I was intentionally using the word salute because I wanted to redefine salute. Because the conformist salute is just what it is. It's a salute. But the competent person will choose what they're going to salute. They will choose what they're going to put their heart into, so to speak. And it's a choice. <laughs> and because it's a choice, they feel some responsibility for it. It doesn't mean it can't be more than that. And we'll get into the fourth stage. But I, I'm suggesting at a minimum, they need to do that. That's the point. At a minimum, they need to do that. Uh, otherwise, they, you know, they wouldn't be responsibly making it, making that choice. For the competent person, I want to talk about what I'm going to call the Dreyfus brothers. Don't separate confident, competent in the two substages, but I'm going to. I'm going to sub. I'm going to put it into the the entry stage and the later stage. At the entry stage of competent. The person has made a choice to that group. They made a decision to become competent in that domain. They feel responsible. And so that's pretty much the stage that people who are learning a profession get to, whether they're wiser MFT students or nursing students or students in any profession where they've done more than just signed on the dotted line, but they've actually become kind of seriously, intellectually, and emotionally engaged in trying to learn that profession. They become aware of alternatives in the initial part of their learning. They become aware, oh, there's more than one theory about how to be an MFT. There's more than one strategy. There's some different alternatives. There's people of different cultural backgrounds. We can't use the same therapy with everybody because there's cultural variabilities. Gee, there's not just cultural variabilities. Some people have different family circumstances. Gee, some people have different economic circumstances. So what happens as one gets into the stage of competence is one becomes increasingly aware. One's aware of variability in situations, but the further one goes into the competence stage, the more one is acutely aware of these situational variability. And they also become more aware of more alternatives. Well, gee, there's more than one theory. There's more than one way to use the same theory. Gee, we got to decide, do I use this theory with this situation or this one with this, or do I try to readapt the theories? What happens as the person progresses in the competence stage, when they're kind of in the middle of the competence stage now, they're so well informed and educated and experienced that they know there's a lot of possibilities and it starts to feel overwhelming. And especially because they care, they care about whether or not they're making a difference. And so, oh my God, I could do strategy one, two, three, or eight. And if I choose the wrong strategy, it may have a bad outcome. Ugh, this is worrisome. This is worrisome because I could make a bad choice and it's going to have a bad outcome for somebody else. But one of you earlier said something like people can become immobilized. And yeah. that's one of the things that can happen in the middle of the competence stage. Yeah, you, could, you could land in the ocean instead of in the river. Right. You could just you kind of start to wring your hands. You can wring your hands and you, you worry about making mistakes. The person who works through that, which usually most confident people do if they become, continue to become confident over time, most or many will, they get to a point where they're more or less at peace with the fact that I'm going to do the best I can do. I'm going to try to be more well-informed, more experienced, more deliberate. I'm not going to be capricious or casual about how I make decisions, but I'm going to really try to do the best I can and become more aware of more alternatives. I'm going to try to learn from my experience. And they continue to become more competent than when they started off in the early stages of competent. And eventually they become more emotionally at peace with where they're at. So before I go to proficient and expert, that's what I want to say about competent. It has to do with the feelings of responsibility. It's a key feeling. It has to do with Levenger's stage of conscientious. Any comments? David. 
So yeah, um, so just so that I'm clear, what you're saying is that when when someone has reached a point of resolution of this tension created by the overwhelm, you know, that results in a mo- might result in a mobilization, right. Right. that's when they have reached the, not just, they haven't gone just from entry level or middle level, they're at the final level of that stage. Is yeah, that what I'll you're saying? Say, I'll say a more advanced, I'll, I'll put it like they're further into the stage solid, and more right. solidified and more solidified. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Such an interesting conversation. I'm wondering if you've run into the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is the bias, the cognitive bias that people tell, have. Somebody with confidence. mentioned. It. Tell me what it is again, because somebody mentioned it to me once before. I forgot what it is. Tell me. What yes, it is. here it comes. The Dunning. I'm going to read a description that Evelyn actually put together. The Dunning-Kruger effect describes a problem with the cognitive bias that people with confidence know what they do not know. While people who lack confidence suffer from the dual burden of not only do they not reach, they reach erroneous conclusions and they make unfortunate choices, but their incompetence robs them of the metacognitive ability to realize it. Yeah, no, that, that's very apt, Linda. That's very, very apt to the, to the confidence stage. We're trying to figure that out. It's just an ongoing conversation we're yeah. having. So. And, and, it, and it really is a good example of the difference between the advanced beginner and the confident. I don't know how many of you read this book that I'm always lauding, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas S. Kuhn. But yeah, so, so Linda, you know, so, you know, the person that, that is practicing normal science that's paradigm bound, all they know is the paradigm that they're using. You know, that all they know is how to do the normal science puzzle solving. And they're oblivious to the anomalies. They're oblivious to the exceptions to the rule. And it's very much related to what you were just characterizing. Um, I have another question. This is Miranda. Yeah. How does this relate to imposter syndrome? Is what you're describing like sort of as the middle competency is that like the beginning of imposter syndrome or is there any what correlation? I'm not, I'm not sure what syndrome you're talking about. Imposter no. syndrome. So like for therapists, it's when you, you have doubt about your ability to actually be a good therapist or be a therapist. Um, you have doubts about your competency, really. You know, if I didn't explain that, please others chime no, in. No, no, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I'm making a distinction that the Dreyfus brothers don't between these different phases of the competency stage. And it sounds like what you're describing would be what I would call an early stage challenge in the in, in the confidence stage. You know, when somebody is, is kind of just embarked on that stage, they got some dilemmas and how I address these self-doubts I have. I have an example. When I obtained my first job as a professor at a small university in Canada, it's my very first job as a professor. I remember sitting at a table with all these other professors, and I did not feel like a real professor. I felt like an imposter, and I've heard other people describe that. So I was considered competent enough to have made entry into the professor class, but I certainly didn't feel that. Uh, mantle of authority and competence at that at that point that came later. That sounds like is that what kind of what you're talking about, Mary Beth? That dynamic. Exactly. Thanks, Brian, yeah. for the example. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think that that's probably a either early stage competent, or one could even argue that's a transition from advanced beginner to confident, so to speak. You know, kind of a kind of an emotional an example of a detail, a further detail. You're kind of helping Mary Beth to, to flesh out the development of these stages. That that's that's a sort of a transition from advanced beginner to confident and early stage confident when one has this feeling of being an imposter, so to speak, of doubt. Yes, and even if you're even if you're competent. If you're sitting with people who are expert, you're aware there's a difference between you and them. Benner is quite noteworthy in that she has done a lot to try to further develop the nuances of the Dreyfus model, and in her case, by looking at the field of nursing and nursing education. I was going to mention that um, right now, since schools are closed and many teachers, K-12 teachers, are having to teach online, and Forrest, you can attest to that, even teachers who felt like they were competent, good teachers before and having to teach online now are feeling like they're doing something for the first time and they don't feel like they're competent. Um, and so in some ways you could use the word imposter. I feel like I'm an imposter of an educator because I don't know what I'm doing online. 
Uh, I think that it's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah. I was thinking about that as Professor Girard was also mentioning his experience. That, um, yeah. Like, yeah, I, I can relate to that. Uh, I'm going to try to get much better. And how many years have you been teaching, classroom teaching? Uh, four full time. And then you were part time in San Diego or on the border. So you have all together probably seven or eight years teaching. And now all of a sudden, it's a whole new thing. I mean, a lot of teachers are really good at building classroom communities and relating face to face to students. And now all of a sudden, they can't develop relationships. And that's part of their teaching. Yeah, some teachers are really good at it already, though, you know, yeah. and so, and I know that I'm not there. Yeah. But. Not all teachers think it's important to develop relationships with your students. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm going to move us toward proficient now, and I want to go through this little list I have here. This advanced beginner, they do know there's exceptions to the rule because of situations, and they're curious. The rules become guiding principles rather than rules, and they can apply principles to situations. So the advanced beginner is aware of situations. They begin to see connections between immediate circumstances and the bigger picture, but they're just beginning to. The competent one, competent person, makes choices between alternative theories and strategies. They do a critical examination of the relevance of situations in making choices. So they have to decide what situations are more relevant than others. They become emotionally invested in the choices. The decisions matter. They're contentious. In the middle part of it, they raise questions about challenges, dilemmas, and uncertainties. And for a time, they can become emotionally immobilized. Proficient. So what happens with the proficient person? And by the way, the expert is just kind of a zen line. Well, you'll see that intuitive. But the, the point for the proficient, is they develop a meta perspective to identify new alternatives and they can critique and evaluate alternatives and they become engaged in creative inquiry. The, the proficient person begins to, in effect, work on developing their own paradigm of practice. And it's a paradigm that they're smart enough to know or wise enough to know is subject to further revision, but they begin to develop an overall perspective on how to do the stuff that's so difficult for the competent person in evaluating alternatives, coming up with new alternatives, and they become kind of in the transformative action research view of things, continually engaged in creative inquiry. They're not yet the Zen-like and intuitively integrated ability to act in the moment of confidence and consistent, even if imperfect, effectiveness. That's the expert. But they're on that path. And after many hours and years of practice, they can do that. There's some script improvisation, which some of you have known me to talk about the value of not just abiding by scripts, but doing improvisation. Being in a community with other people who are also doing script improvisation, that's what the experimental community is about. Ideally, that's what Wiser aims to be about, a community where people can do script improvisation together. And here's a significant emotional thing, I think, that happens with the proficient person becoming expert. They go beyond their commitment to a particular community, to a particular profession, to a particular group's values. They may still value some group's values more than others, but they want to find their own voice. They have a larger sense of commitment a more internalized sense of where they're headed. They may choose to be involved with some groups more than others. A person may be a committed attorney, but they have a commitment that goes beyond being a committed attorney. They've decided that they're going to be for certain values of social justice. You know, you have somebody like David Yamada who has certain particular aspects of the law that he's concerned with in terms of therapeutic jurisprudence and workplace bullying problems. One gets to the point that they have their own voice. David has his own voice, his own commitment. It's not antithetical necessarily to other groups' commitment, but it's his commitment. And with his commitment in mind, he finds groups to align himself with. And he can respectfully disagree with groups that he aligns himself with. So he might mostly agree with Group X on most things, but there's a particular issue that he will disagree with on that issue with that particular group. The proficient person has a certain sort of personal commitment, but to larger vision of society and justice, and they can be allied with groups, but not narrowly or overly rigidly so. You can see the difference between the competent teacher and the proficient teacher is that when the teacher is showing 
when we used to have overheads or when you're using slides, a competent teacher will be able to competently go from slide one to slide 50 and competently describe everything. But the proficient teacher will notice halfway through that everybody has got glassy eyes and they're not responding and will at that point do something different. They'll stop showing the slides and they'll maybe do an exercise where people get into small groups. And I I think also we don't have to be afraid of, I mean, in the university, you hear people say, oh, that was such a great class. That was such a great professor. Or you hear people say, I know she's the top of the department, but she's an awful teacher. I mean, it feels like I never come out of that class having learned anything. It's so didactic and stupid. And, and so, you know, we have to be able to, and people um, and youth, um, you know, it's part of media literacy in a way. We have to be able to critique something at the top. And there's so much critique out there in the world right now that it's like you can be consumed by the amount of critique we're seeing. But I think, you know, we also have to be able to critique what's known as expertise. Levenger's framework of ego development, I had conformist and self-conscious and conscientious and then autonomous and integrated. She has earlier stages and an earlier stage that's pre-conformist, which is usually applicable to mostly like seven and eight-year-olds and six-year-olds. It does apply to some adults. Some adults do get stuck at a stage that's pre-conformist. It's called opportunistic. And opportunistic is just as it sounds. Enough said on that topic. I don't want to say any more. I'll let everybody use their own imagination about those rare circumstances when opportunism applies to adults. But anyway, I want to share something else here. It's a homework assignment for each of you. Here it is, the Wiser webpage. Okay, everybody's homework assignment at your convenience. You go to the webpage, you go to academics. The drop down says degree programs. Degree programs, you slide over. And at the very least, you go to your own degree program. You know, Forrest goes to the MS in Education and Leadership, Gillian, Mary Beth, others go to the MFT one, Karen and Victor go to the doctoral one. Each of those programs, like let's just do the doctoral one, oh, here's the outcomes. You go to the outcome section, the learning outcome section, and you read down read the broad mission, but you go to the part that says program goals, learning outcomes, and measures. You can read the learning goals stuff. The main thing in the learning goals section, for, and there's a similar one for MFT and MS students, there's three links that are to short articles about the Dreyfus model. And I strongly urge each of you to take 30 minutes or so per article, a total of an hour and a half, to read those three articles on the link. And they're found under program goals, learning outcomes for each of your degree programs. If you can read through the program goals, but what I want you to focus on are these, the program learning outcomes. This is for the EDD, but there's similar ones for the MFT. And they're divided into eight categories. There's program specific learning outcomes, which you can think of as the content, like the content for the interdisciplinary program in higher education and social change. There's content for the MFT, et cetera. And there's anywhere from three to seven or eight sub outcomes that are content specific. And then quite significantly for each program, there's program outcomes using the Dreyfus model. And in the case of the EDD students, we're expecting proficiency. And we then attempt to articulate in some detail, about that much detail, how proficiency is, can be actually applied to this area of study. Or in the case of MFT students, how being competent is applied to MFT. So I'd like you to especially read through this. There's also brief statements about how, in this case, proficiency applies to self-directed learning, action research, multiculturalism, social change and social justice, communication, collaboration, and building bridges of the future. You should try to read all of those, but look through, look through that and then feel free to discuss with me. Let me know if you have questions. Try to look it over and think about it for yourself in relation to uh, today's discussion. 
hooray for this seminar, John, because now I have a better understanding of why our human dignity community and the work that we do resonates with this style of learning. And that's exactly what I wanted to get out of the, this seminar. So thanks to you and everybody that's contributed. And I just want to say, uh, as we're going through these different phases and steps, I'm reflecting on my recent experience. Karen, you'll ex appreciate this. I, my 90 year old father had a major health problem, was in the hospital for 16 days. We got to the point where he needed to come out of the hospital, had to make the decision between sending him to high risk rehab or becoming the rehab for him. And we chose becoming the rehab and it's not an easy task because I bet Karen could tell me how hard it is, but it's not an easy task. But what I think was a saving grace is the experts within my community of healthcare providers had, uh, I think, over the years developed this capacity for dignifying humility, which is they were expert in what they do, but they are also open to listening to how to work with the family. And that was a saving grace. So all of what you've talked about, uh, John, seems to be immediately relevant, relevant to my own personal experience of uh, navigating this new world of having to become a, a rehab provider just because of the COVID conditions we're living through. So thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to use what Linda said as a um, uh, segue. Uh, when I took care of each my mother and my father, as, as they declined and, and died, there was a permanent uh, decline in all of their abilities and in, in themselves as people. So we'll call that a regression. So that's the extreme example of another principle I want to share, which is the idea of a swing. Mm. And that is, uh, I'll just speak in the first person, but I think this is common uh, beyond me, which is swinging based on a lot of things between, say, being expert and proficient and competent. Hopefully, I don't crash and burn and just become like novice again. But I, I do have these swings or oscillations. And then with it, what is that swing? It's a, it's a range, a, a spectrum of energy and effect and and if you think of a wave, the, the wave can build crest and recede kind of like that, or it can be like a big kahuna. Now, it's just different kinds of wave actions. So I, I look at these, uh, the Dreyfus stages and stages in general as, as wave actions with a spectrum. Are you describing yourself or your parents? Well, the, the example of my parents is what that the, the shift uh, amongst the stages, so to speak, yeah. can be absolute and permanent and irrevocable. And the way my parents changed in their nature uh, was very different. Um, I, I'll just mark that without describing it. The, mm -hmm. the, 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 the way each of them died over a period of time like that was very different, but each of them lost permanently what they were before. What I'm saying is that's an extreme example in a unidirectional example of a principle that I'm calling the swing. That we're all, you know, we're expanding and contracting. We're expanding our spectrum of being and constricting it. And and I, that applies to the Dreyfus model, in my opinion. I am stated simply, I have my good days and my bad days. <laughs> sometimes I'm on and sometimes I'm off and sometimes in between. I've been doing this 35 years and I got um, a new client in my private practice and I had a moment of going, oh my, and I didn't say this, I, but I'm an imposter. What am I doing here? <laughs> I'm not an imposter. But that that moment for a moment i felt like one yeah. mm -hmm. um, so i do have one other thing i want to share which is the use of terms the use of language 
the way the word emotions was being used throughout today's seminar does not resemble at all what I understand emotions to be and their significance. It's not a right or wrong, a good or bad, but it's a distinction. And it's something that I'm very concerned about, you know, just generally, routinely, because the way my clients use words, body language, expressions, their point of reference, it, I don't assume it's that we share in common what things mean. So what's for me a sensitizing concept to draw from another model may not be for the other. And a great example of that was the story Ignacio told last work group meeting about safety, trust, and respect. His whole story was not totally not Eurocentric, put it that way, and totally spot on. So I just wanted to put that out there. One way to look at any developmental stage theory, in my view, and it's just one part of the way to look at it, is that at most, a stage theory characterizes our most optimal level of functioning. It doesn't mean we're functioning at that level every moment. It just says that this is the level that, in, a, in the most optimal way, that we might function some of the time. It was, as you went over the, the Dreyfus model, I, of course, am just a new in MFT, so I can't, I can't speak to that. So what I did instead was I used it as a filter to think about what I do know about and what I have done in the past. So for example, I'm a doula, postpartum doula, childbirth educator, postpartum educator. So I was thinking about how parents come in with me and they don't even have their baby yet. And they, everything I say, what diaper to use and what, whatever it is I say is good. They take that as the beginning, like, that's the absolute, I'm going to do it that way. That's the and rule. Then, <laughs> right, that's the rule. And then they go into, you see them a, a few days after birth and they're a wreck, but they're wanting to get better. They're advanced beginning. <laughs> and it's very interesting because they see me as an expert because I have the confidence of parenting. And so then my job is really more to say, you're going to get to expert because you're going to learn, because you have to learn about your child, you will become the expert and your child will keep making you an expert because they'll never be the same. They'll always be changing. So they get to competency and I'll say, I'll see them in a couple of months or a, a month later, and they've got the baby on their arm and they're excellent at what they're doing. And then something gets thrown at them. Maybe they can't breastfeed like they thought, or a child has an illness or life things happen and all of a sudden they're back down to advanced beginner with the they're trying to follow a rule but something that gets thrown at them means they have to restart and that that circumstance of their life creates the need to grow and become a more expert learner and they become the expert in whatever it is that they've had to become an expert in so then i see them a couple days later and they know all these things and i let them tell me and they're, you know, it's just an amazing kind of scope. And I was just, I guess I wanted to build on the fact that you say the need to learn puts them in a state of expertise very quickly. That's a great example. And it sounds also like your way of relating to them, as well as over time, their way of relating to one another in their own experience is a good example of the Vygotsky social learning process and the notion of zone of proximal development. So anyway, yeah. that's a great yeah. example. Thanks. That's good. Other comments for people? We have another we have another two minutes left before Sadia sings Holy Curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> I have a brief comment is that if you've been dealing, if you've had any experience dealing with healthcare with loved ones, you will know that frequently you will think you are in the presence of an expert in dealing with your loved one, but in fact, you are not. And uh, I'm referring here to medical error. I think that as users of healthcare systems, if we approach healthcare systems as though we are novices and the medical staff are all expert, it's a very dangerous situation to definitely, be in. Definitely, definitely. Anyway. And, and, and what you just reminded me of is that social systems and organizations can kind of dumb down the expertise of those practicing in the social system. So that is that the healthcare system could take a competent health professional and create a circumstance where they would then function as advanced beginner. 
And since we talked about curiosity a lot in the Dreyfus model, this seems to be a perfect song. Never lose that holy curiosity. Always find the time to open our eyes. You can choose the way to lose, use your mind. Do this for the earth or the world. Don't leave the truth behind. Was a long time ago, it seemed to be. When I was a follower in a modern society. Then one fine day I found these words of hope. They allowed me to see for myself a much better way to go. I said, never lose that holy curiosity. Always find the time to open our eyes. You can choose the way to lose your mind. Do this for the world. Don't leave the truth behind. Sometimes the truth may be hard to see. With all the distractions around, it's hard to know what to believe. Listen to your heart, to the truth within. You know that it's telling you the right way for you to live. I said, never lose that holy curiosity. Always find the time to open our eyes. You can choose the way to use your mind. Do this for the earth. Don't leave the truth behind. Do this for the world. Don't leave the truth behind.